Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar where we are launching um, the revised guidelines for mental health services and staff on working with people from ethnic minority communities. Um, I just quickly want to thank everyone for attending because I know uh, look, we're all busy in terms of the mental health services, COVID out there in the voluntary sector. So thanks everyone for attending and I hope you enjoy it. We'll only be keeping you um, uh, for an hour. I'll just briefly bring you through the uh, agenda. So um, we'll have an opening address from the minister who I'll introduce in a few moments. Um, then we'll have an overview of the project from uh, Fiona and Eva in terms of mental health reform. And then we'll have a panel discussion uh, in terms of, you know, people who actually have, uh, you know, really connected into this project to give us the, the lived experience that we need. And finally, we have some closing remarks from Gary Kernan, our Director of Regulation. Um, if at any time during the uh, presentation of the webinar, uh, people feel unwell or upset. Um, we just want to make sure there's some numbers there, including the uh, Samaritans and the Pieta House who are um, accessible. So again, I want to thank everyone for coming along. I just want to say on behalf of the Mental Health Commission, um, one of the jobs we want to do is to put in place a framework to assist our mental health services. Um, so we have sharing the vision and we have the new Mental Health Act coming down the line. And one of the things we're trying to do is put a framework in place to help services and to give services um, a catalyst towards being the best they can be. And so the guidelines today are part of that because very often, you know, we can concentrate on, you know, uh, a number of particular things that get the headlines a lot. But what we want to do is make sure that our service is excellent also in and in and around the margins and that that idea of the margin actually is is changing because what we're finding is is that around 17 percent of people in ireland uh, could class themselves as coming from a, an ethnic minority um, background so it's really important that we use these guidelines um well and to really what i like about the guidelines is it's tapping in to the experience of the voluntary sector, particularly led by mental health reform, who, who coordinated it, but also tapping into the experience and knowledge of the provider. So it isn't a thing of, you know, um, that has it, it, they have been developed with the people who are providing the service and with the people who are receiving the service with the idea that we work together uh, to be the best we can be. So, look, I'll, I'll We'll push on um, because you'll, you'll learn much more as we go through it. But just to say, I think most of us, all of us here have a shared concern towards uh, a diverse and inclusive and decent Ireland. Um, I grew up in, you know, I was born in the 1960s, grew up in the 70s in Dublin. And um, it was just basically, you know, a bunch of Dublin white people whose parents were from the country. Uh, and now what I see from my children is a much more diverse, inclusive country. Uh, where I have the pleasure, where I see the beautiful thing of my children's uh, friends and their parents being from many places around Ireland and many places around Europe and many places around the world. And I really welcome that. And that's the way our service will be going, both in terms of who's delivering it and the people who are receiving it. So I just want to, we're, we're absolutely privileged to have the uh, Minister for Mental Health and all the persons here with us, Mary Butler. And I've, I, it was funny enough, we met for the first time yesterday uh, in, in person, and yet the amount of work that has gone on since the minister has come into place is amazing. If you think of her reforming the Mental Health Act, if you think of sharing the vision in mental health, and then if you think of older persons and what has happened in terms of nursing homes and communities. So I think, I, it was funny, I was reading around and the best I saw was given by a previous minister for mental health from a different party um, about that this minister was genuine, committed, caring, and, you know, and sincere. And there are kind of things that um, I, you very rarely hear about a politician. So I really welcome it. But I also add to that the amount of work that uh, Minister Butler is getting through. So thank you, Minister Butler. And I hand the floor over to you. Um, John, thank you very much for that. But unfortunately, you will hear behind me that the bells are ringing. So I have to go and attend a vote. I have no choice. And you just can never account for what will happen during um, a live broadcast. So would it be possible for that you could 
bring Fiona in now and as soon as this vote is over it'll take about 10 minutes I will be back online with you um, I'm really sorry about this you can hear you can hear the bells and I and I actually have no choice it's the finance bill and it's so important no problem minister we'll uh, as soon as you come back we'll uh, we'll accommodate in, in yeah, I really apologize and listen, Water. thank you for your really kind words and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say and and to give my contribution thank you no problem so um, with that said, I'll now hand over to uh, Fiona. Thanks so much, John. Um, and we'd like to, to thank the, the minister for her, her participation here today and, and look forward to, to having her back shortly. Um, also, we'd like to, to thank um, John and his colleagues in, in the Mental Health Commission um, for prioritising and showing leadership on the importance of, of this area and of ensuring that we have really person-centred um, mental health um, supports and services across the country for everyone who needs them. Um, I'm the CEO of Mental Health Reform. For those who may not be familiar with Mental Health Reform, we're the National Coalition for Mental Health. We're a membership-based organisation. We have over 77 members um, under our coalition. Our members represent a diversity of, of issues. Um, some are mental health service providers, others um, represent specific groups such as ethnic minorities, um, which we are here discussing today. Um, ethnic minorities, I'm sure everyone on, on this webinar will agree, are a hugely central and important group in the rich tapestry that is Irish society. Um, Ethnic minority communities are a growing percentage of, um, of, 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 Irish, um, of Irish society. And in the last census in 2016, um, found that ethnic minorities, they made up 17.8% of the Irish population. Um, now, research tells us that there is a higher um, incidence of mental health challenges among people from ethnic minority communities. As mental health reform, we very much acknowledge that many ethnic minority communities in Ireland face really deep structural inequalities, which also impacts their, their mental health and well-being. Um, this is something that needs to be acknowledged and needs to be addressed more broadly um, as we move to make Ireland a more equal society. It's also important for me to note um, that ethnic minority communities, they're, they're not homogenous and, you know, we're, we're using to term today, but each of these diverse communities may face different barriers. This may be different from one group to the next and from individual to individual. Um, and, you know, we also realise in, in relation to mental health, um, you know, everyone's mental health journey is different and everyone's mental health is, is unique. And that, that's why, you know, our new mental health policy and, you know, the work of, of mental health reform has really advocated for a person centred approach to the delivery of mental health supports and services. In these updated guidelines, um, there is a special mention on intersectionality, um, which really acknowledges um, some of what I've, I've been talking about. So the focus of today is to look at the importance of providing culturally sensitive mental health services and seeking to ensure equitable outcomes for ethnic minority communities. Our national um, mental health policy sharing the vision is based on the principles of person-centered approach um, of human rights, of recovery focused or trauma informed services and within that it recommends the delivery of diverse and culturally competent mental health supports throughout all services. In 2016, in partnership with the Mental Health Commission, um, Mental Health Reform uh, and the Commission published guidelines for mental health services and staff working with people from ethnic minority communities. Um, these were based on a previous position paper and a previous consultation that we did within our network in 2014. Now, the guidelines are intended to inform mental health services and staff on how best to provide care to individuals from ethnic minority communities. So we're here 
five years later. And I, I think, and my colleague Ita will, will take us through, these guidelines are arguably just as relevant today as they were um, in 2016. While much change has happened and we acknowledge, you know, there's been many positive reforms, um, it, it is still something that we need to acknowledge and need to work towards. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to ask my colleague, Ita Conley, who is our Policy and Research Officer, to come on and to talk us through um, this, this project. Thanks, Ita. Thanks very much, Fiona. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ita Connolly. I'm part of the research team here at Mental Health Reform, and I worked on the revised guidelines. I'd like to firstly acknowledge my colleagues here in Mental Health Reform and also in the Mental Health Commission, uh, who've all worked so hard uh, towards bringing these updated guidelines to fruition. And I'd also like to thank all those who took part in the consultation. So my role here today is to talk briefly about the consultation and how it led to the updating of the guidelines. So in terms of the consultation itself, it was conducted between July and August 2021 using a combination of qualitative methods. And these were online questionnaires, focus groups with service users and providers, plus written feedback from interested stakeholder groups. We engage with mental health reform members who work with ethnic minority communities in Ireland, service users from ethnic minority communities and mental health service providers. In terms of the analysis of the feedback, we use an inductive approach to the data to ensure the previous themes developed in the 2016 guidelines did not dominate the analysis. And more importantly, to ensure that both service user and provider voices were heard and understood. So I'm just going to briefly highlight some themes that we received from feedback. Um, firstly, so the feedback from the service users with lived experience of mental health services in Ireland. Now, there were some common themes which permeated both the discussion and written responses. They were firstly access to services. There is a lack of knowledge of the systems and supports in place in Ireland. It is difficult to know how to access mental health services for those who do not understand English. And one respondent commented to us that mental, the mental health system strongly focuses on cultural norms within Ireland. Now, the next part, engagement with services. For those who have engaged with the services, the benefits and attitude, or sorry, the behaviours and attitudes of mental health staff generated a number of issues. And um, we just want to highlight some of those now. Um, some respondents cited incidents of perceived discrimination on racial grounds and communicated that they did not feel respected and valued as an individual in crisis. Preconceived ideas about someone based on how they look was prevalent in respondent experiences. On how this could be improved, there was a clear emphasis on things such as respect for the individual and seeing the person rather than a colour or a label. On cultural issues regarding mental health, many of the respondents identified cultural issues regarding their own mental health and perceptions within their communities and traditions which make articulating mental health difficulties problematic for them. And just to say that the language barrier intersect, intersected with all those things and was very important thread throughout the consultation. Now moving on to the next slide, which is um, related to feedback from mental health service providers. Now the information gleaned from the data can be understood through the themes of awareness of the guidelines, training, monitoring and evaluation, and improvements to accessibility. So firstly, on awareness of the guidelines. It is clear from this cohort of providers that the guidelines were not widely known. However, when the guidelines were read by the respondents, some had very valuable reflections and suggestions as to how they could be improved to meet the needs of a disparate workforce. Some of the respondents felt that in order to make the guidelines useful, there needed to be cultural shifts within the service to respond to the emerging needs. My suggestions on how to achieve this included training. And this was definitely one of the most common themes which surfaced in the data. Now, many staff feel that they are being respectful and are culturally aware of the needs of their patients. 
but sometimes feel ill-equipped or unsupported in their practice. So therefore, respondents suggested ongoing training in order to help them do their job. Now on monitoring and evaluation, a better understanding of how the guidelines and practice is being adhered to was suggested, um, and that need for auditing and monitoring of practice as well. In terms of improvements to accessibility, some issues highlighted were language, reaching out to communities, interpreters and, and things like that. And in order to improve the guidelines themselves and actually make them more accessible and more user friendly for those working on the front line, suggestions included making the document shorter and accessible online and again in, in different languages. So just on the last slide to conclude, um, so as Fiona said, five years on from the original guidelines, we found that through our analysis of the consultation that the themes in the original guidelines are still relevant. So to us that signals that more work needs to be done and a cultural shift is required in order to ensure that mental health services are accessible, that they are person focused, are compassionate and understanding of cultural sensitivities. At a practical level, we shorten the guidelines quite a lot um, to make them more user friendly for providers. And also in 2021, Mental Health Reform produced a cultural competency toolkit, which we hope would provide that practical guidance that from the respondents that it's clearly needed. Um, I just, we wanted to give a taster of some of the responses from service users. So we're going to play a short clip now. Oh, we had some music there. Um, so thanks very much for your time. I'm just going to hand you back to Fiona. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ita, and um, and thank you to to our comms team who put together that video. Um, so so the guidelines are live now and they're accessible. Um, they're accessible on the website of Mental Health Reform and I believe also on the website of Mental Health Commission. Um, and attendees will will receive the the guidelines as well in due course. Um, I'm very aware um that the minister will be returning shortly. Um, but uh, I, the the show must go on. Oh, there she is, Minister. Just, just I was just going to go into the next session. Um, so I'm going to to give you the floor and thank you for your support for this important um, area and and hand over to you. Thank you so much, Minister. Not at all, and thank you for that. Um, as you know, these are things that happen when you're when you're here in, in the doll. But thankfully, um, we had a majority in the vote, and if the bells ring again, I'll be able to stay with you. 
So good afternoon, everybody, and it is my honour and privilege to launch today these revised guidelines for mental health services and staff on working with people from ethnic minority communities. I would like to thank the Mental Health Commission and Mental Health Reform for their kind invitation. The ethnic minority community in Ireland come from a range of ethnic and cultural backgrounds, incorporating a rich tapestry of experience, skills, perspectives, and creativity. It is imperative that Ireland's mental health services serve the entire population, including people from ethnic minority groups. The 2016 census found that ethnic minorities make up 17.8% of the Irish population, no doubt a significant minority. In 2017, the government formally recognised Irish travellers as a distinct ethnic group, which accounts for 0.7% of the usually resident population. The guidelines that we are launching this afternoon are vitally important to ensuring equitable access to appropriate services and supports for everyone in Ireland. They are designed to assist mental health service and staff in the delivery of culturally competent mental health services. Crucially, these guidelines were developed with input from individuals who use the services, which make them hugely impactful as they reflect what people need and expect when accessing supports. Our national mental health policy sharing the vision published in June 2020 makes a series of recommendations to improve the mental health outcomes for the whole country. The guidelines developed in partnership between the Mental Health Commission and Mental Health Reform align perfectly with sharing the vision. They are an, ex an excellent example of an initiative that can address the particular needs of people from ethnic minority groups and in effect improve their mental health outcomes. Sharing the vision places the individual at the heart of service delivery and contains recommendations for services to address and accommodate the specific needs and the unique socioeconomic and cultural background of individual service users. The guidelines which we are launching today, they speak perfectly to this point. They seek to ensure the needs of the individual are met when they are engaging with services. The guidelines are broken down into six teams to provide practical advice to assist mental health services and staff in their work in fact, guidance that we should all take note of and follow. So firstly, mental health services and staff should respect the diverse beliefs and values of people from ethnic minority communities and deliver care and treatment in a manner that takes account of such beliefs. And I know mental health staff do that. Communication has been identified as a significant barrier for people from ethnic minority groups and therefore language support should be provided where necessary. And I think of the likes of my mind, the organisation that provide 4,000 counselling hours a month um, for the HSC to support people during these terrible times, living with COVID and living with the stresses and strains of everyday life. And my mind are actually providing supports in 17 different languages. So it's great to see that those supports are there for anyone who might be witnessing um, a significant barrier in relation to language. Accessibility to mental health services should be enhanced for people from ethnic minority communities. We know that there is still stigma around mental health and in seeking mental health support, particularly among certain communities. Families, friends, carers and supporters should be provided opportunities for involvement and support. Training should be provided to ensure staff are appropriately aware skilled, experienced and knowledgeable to meet the care needs of people from ethnic minority communities. Ongoing evaluation, review and monitoring should be performed to ensure that the mental health needs of people from ethnic minority groups are being adequately met. Sharing the vision also acknowledges the additional work that is required to promote positive mental health and build resilience among specific priority groups deemed to be at risk. Among these priority groups include members of the traveller community, asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. The policy recommends tailored interventions to fulfil unmet needs and to build strengths among these groups. 
Moreover, sharing the vision seeks to provide mental health services that recognize and respond to diversity and advocates maximizing the delivery of diverse and culturally competent mental health supports through all services to respond to the needs of these groups. I am pleased to say the work of the National Implementation and Monitoring Committee tasked with driving share in the vision is progressing well. While the policy will be implemented over a 10 year period, many of its recommendations have already been implemented and some of them are well underway. These include significant advancements in mental health promotion and digital mental health supports. For example, as I said earlier about my mind, it's here again, but they support um, various communities online in 17 to 18 different languages. Importantly, individuals representing the traveller community and other ethnic minority groups were appointed to the specialist group panel to support the committee and will provide specialist input at various points in the implementation of the policy. Particular demographic groups have consistently been shown by both national and international research to have increased risk of suicidal behaviour. This includes individuals from the traveller community other groups with potentially increased risk of suicidal behaviour, where the research evidence is either less consistent or limited, include asylum seekers, refugees and migrants. The government recognises the increased risk of suicide among these groups and have specific actions in Connecting for Life, the National Suicide Reduction Strategy, to address this challenge. In November 2020, I extended the strategy for four years to 2024 to ensure its continued and effective implementation. The Ethnic Minorities Mental Health Guidelines will further support this by attempting to remove barriers from people when accessing services. There is considerable work ongoing within the health sector to address issues facing priority groups. These include service improvement initiatives, to meet the health, including the mental health needs of this group. Overall, actions are underway to promote equality and to eliminate discrimination through various governmental policies and strategies. At a policy level across government, there is a commitment to improving access to equitable, inclusive and non-discriminatory services, which is reflected in the relevant sharing the vision recommendations, as well as throughout the policy as a whole. Our public services must be accessible to all and they must be delivered in a culturally competent manner. The National Traveller and Roma Inclusion Strategy, which takes a whole of government approach, recognises this. Published in 2018, the strategy identifies the travellers and Roma are among the most disadvantaged and marginalised people in Ireland. It seeks to deliver change across our public services that will see significant improvements to the lives of travellers and Roma in Ireland in particular and tangible ways. The strategy acknowledges that the mental health difficulties and the increased risk of suicide, they are significant issues for this community and they're caused by many social determinants. These are being addressed as part of a comprehensive health action plan which is currently being developed. The HSC has published a second national intercultural health strategy in 2019. As with sharing the vision and connecting for life, the guidelines launched today will also complement this strategy, which provides a comprehensive and integrated approach to addressing the many unique health and support needs experienced by the increasing number of HSE service users from diverse ethnic and cultural backgrounds who live in Ireland. In addition, the HSC also provides an intercultural awareness e-learning programme this programme is designed to support staff to be aware and respectful of ethnic, cultural and religious diversity of people who use our services. It is important to recognise that social stereotypes about certain groups of people formed unconsciously by service providers have the potential to harm those that are in need of support. This e-learning programme helps to reduce the potential harm that this unconscious bias may cause. Importantly, the Department of Health and its agencies are committed on a statutory basis to eliminating discrimination and promoting human rights and equality under the public sector duty. Finally, I would like to thank John Farrelly, 
his team in the Mental Health Commission, and Fiona Coyle and her team in mental health reform for producing these very, very valuable guidelines. I appreciate that this is an area that both organisations have sought improvements in, building on the original guidelines that were published originally in 2016. I would also like to commend the work of Mental Health Reform for producing and launching their Cultural Competency Toolkit in October of this year. The toolkit supported by HEC and Slauncher Care will provide an additional and valuable resource for mental health services and staff in working with ethnic minority communities. I would encourage all mental health staff and service providers to familiarise themselves with these user-friendly and intuitive guidelines to ensure fair, equitable and appropriate access for all members of society, something that I, along with government as a whole, fully, I'm fully committed to achieving. So I encourage each and every one of you to read this book. I look forward to reading it hopefully later on this evening. And I want to congratulate you all on a very successful event today and the publication of these guidelines. You have my full support in seeking their full implementation. Garmila Mahabud. Minister, um, thank you very much uh, on behalf of our, ourselves. And look, just to thank you for uh, the time and energy in terms of, of mental health, you, be, you can begin to see that society, even in the conversations we're having now, is, is, um, is changing. And, and it only changes by having leaders and champions. And so with, when we're seeing the championing at a political level, funny enough, one of the discussions we were having yesterday in preparation was, we have to somehow allow all those other champions that are out there in the different communities to give them a pathway to come forward and to be part of our change. So I just want to thank you. Um, and I also want to say, in terms of sharing the vision, um, the collaborative approach to that, I know our own chairman of the commission is very strong on implementing sharing the vision as well. So we now have a group of people. And, and finally, I'm not sure if people realize, but also the building of a team in the Department of Health around delivery of mental health, uh, which is something that I watch uh, as a regular, watching these group of people that are assisting us as a state body to get things done. And look, um, thanks a lot. And we're going to keep driving. And really, thanks for putting the energy in here for us today. Okay, I'll now hand over to uh, Fiona Coyle, who will facilitate uh, a panel discussion. Thank you so much, Sean. And, and just to echo your words to the Minister, just um, to say thanks and it's it's wonderful um, to, to hear those strong words on kind of what needs to be done and also the leadership um, the leadership you've shown on this issue and across the board on, on mental health, um, including in particular around the, the Mental Health Act and, and getting the Heads of Bill um, published this year. So yeah, um, thank you for, for your ongoing leadership. Um, I'm um, delighted now to um, to be able to to, to present our, our two panelists, um, who both of them uh, I I think we're, we're really privileged to to hear from today. So I'd like to ask um, the two panelists just to to turn on their their camera. So. Um, Emilia Markaletska um, is a health and advocacy officer at Carger, where she currently leads the Migrant Mental Health and Wellbeing Initiative and the Health Connect Project. She's also the chair of the board of directors of CKU, Centre for Counselling and Therapy, and a board director of the National Women's Council. Um, her extensive experience includes supporting individuals, building capacity of migrant communities, advocating for inclusive service, and policy and media work. Um, our second uh, speaker today is Blessing Dada. Um, Blessing is an Irish Nigerian woman. She was born and raised in Dublin and is the eldest of four children. Um, she is passionate about social justice, youth and mental health, and is currently completing a degree in youth work. Um, in her spare time, I, I don't know where she gets it, she volunteers with a lot of organisations such as Spung Out and Cross Care, and she is a Shine Sea Change ambassador. Now, Bessie speaks very openly about her mental health difficulties so that she can eliminate the stigma attached to, to seeking help. And I, I think, you know, she has openly encouraged everyone, in particular minorities, um, groups to take care of their mental health. Um, so, 
both of you, you're you're very welcome. Um, so Amelia, I'm going to delve in um with the first question um to you. Um, and I suppose individuals from ethnic minority communities, they, they face a number of barriers which has come up um today in ETA's presentation uh, in accessing mental health services, but in your work with with um, ethnic minority communities, what barriers have you identified that really impede individuals from getting the support that they need? Um, thank you, Fiona, and uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, uh, we really welcome the revised guidelines. Um, yeah, the, the uh, of course, information, cultural, language barrier, also lack of trust, mental health stigma and shame and, and cost as well uh, uh, are significant barriers to accessing services. <clears throat> so these are structural barriers which overlap with individual health beliefs and, and behaviours. So an example of such barriers is, for instance, one man's journey to see a psychiatrist, which involves first asks, as uh, uh, giving him information about the service, helping him uh, to get a medical card, finding a doctor who will accept him on a medical card, and only then helping with a timely appointment with a psychiatrist. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, some people lack awareness about mental health distress to so somatize their, their distress, or some individuals ascribe to uh, indigenous or spiritual knowledge about uh, uh, mental distress. Um, the information bar is the big one. So we tell people about uh, what supports are available here, how to navigate the system, what to expect from mental health services, you know, what are Samaritans uh, um, uh, and what are their patient rights. Uh, but even when having such information, the acceptability of mental health services and perceived accommodation of their linguistic and, and cultural needs uh, uh, can be a barrier. So we often help people to find mental health professionals who speak their own language, uh, they are from their own culture, uh, if they can afford, uh, uh, you know, uh, this private support. And sometimes people even prefer to go to your, their own countries of origin and, and seek help there. And, you know, the last thing is, I suppose, is the stigma, a big issue. And so let's say, you know, one lady spends most of her days in bed struggling even to get kids to work, but she still refuses to see a doctor for the fear of being seen as a mad person. Uh, being afraid to be ostracized by her community or that, they would, that her children will be taken away from her into care. Uh, and for people in direct provision, you know, that's, uh, it's a big issue as well, uh, a fear of uh, uh, how will that influence their international, international pro uh, 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 protection application. Um, yeah, it's a big one. No, thank you for that. And yeah, I want to pick up on something you mentioned around the, the, the health inequalities among kind of and the structural inequalities. I know, know Karja, who you work for, is an organisation that aims to tackle health inequalities more generally among ethnic minority communities. Um, what role does co cultural competency play in addressing those inequalities? You know, how important is it in, in, in really addressing some of those barriers? Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, we will be saying that cultural competency is fundamental for reducing health disparities. Um, but, you know, migration is a risk factor for developing mental health issues. But this risk can be mediated by the conditions in the new country, in a host country, and culturally competent health service is, is part of that. So both international studies and the experience of our clients tell us that uh, the barriers that I've described to you uh, contribute to delays in help seeking and uh, um, uh, experience of more complex pathways to, to care. So maybe use of emergency services, police involvement, involuntary admissions, and that's cross-national uh, um, uh, uh, care use. And um, the studies show that minorities are less likely to be offered talk therapies uh, and instead get maybe higher doses of uh, uh, dosages of medication and endure uh, more restraining practices. On the top of that, when we talk about recovery outcomes, they're poorer for ethnic minorities. They're less likely to experience remission or return you know, to, to, to work 
for instance. So um, in Cardi, we try to bridge this gap. Uh, and for instance, you know, thanks to the funding that we received from, from the IREC and lottery grants, we trained mental health support and advocacy workers for ethnic minorities who reach out to their communities. They raise awareness about mental health, build trust, signpost uh, uh, to services, help people to cope and to solve practical issues. And, you know, we hope that if, this, if we sustain this project, it will be very good asset for, for mental health services, judging on the guidelines. Uh, that we're launching today. You know, they will facilitate, working with the communities will facilitate timely access to services, so will help with all those linguistic, cultural and practical issues, and will support recovery and, and self-management as well. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I think you highlighted a really important point there more generally that we would be um, very much advocating for as mental health reform is the role of advocacy. And you know that everyone has has a right to, to advocacy, a right to information, you know, and a right to support. And going back to your first question around, you know, the, the complexity of the system, you know, I think it's 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 widely acknowledged that our mental health supports and services can be complex for, for everyone. Um, and in, in particular, acknowledging maybe those who, who aren't even familiar with the, the broad structures would find it even more, more challenging. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the guidelines, how do you think, you know, that they, they can support um, the, the services and staff and, you know, what, how, what advice would you have to, to all those mental health professionals um, on, on this webinar today on, on how they can use the guidelines and also link in with, with organisations as yourselves and other members of, of mental health reform? Mm. Um, you know, when, when I read them and as the minister said, you know, these guidelines sort of help to translate the new uh, uh, policies policy priorities into actions and they are I think they show clear pathways and give practical tips both to the managers and to practitioners um, so I imagine that following the guidelines uh, um, will make the job easier people will feel more connected uh, effective and and of course you know uh, uh, it will improve outcomes for ethnic minority uh, service users uh, so, you know, for instance, things like better use of how to make the best use of interpreters, having translated materials uh, uh, at hand, acknowledging own bias or system bias and being respectful of, of beliefs, cultural and religious beliefs uh, will bring better outcomes. Uh, the recovery planning was mentioned and definitely we see that clients who have uh, uh, good support let's say of mental health nurses, or they get uh, good advice regarding self-management, they do recover better. Uh, and again, coming to, to, uh, to the advocates that you mentioned and the collaboration with migrant communities, I think it can help mental health services with, you know, from prevention to care to recovery. And we do welcome mental health services engaging with Gorgia. We do help with, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, linking with community services uh, and the people that we engage now, they speak uh, Polish, Arabic, Albanian, Yoruba, French languages, and these workers are linked with their groups already. Uh, they can help with disseminating of information mentioned in the guidance again, and they can encourage access again mentioned in the guidelines. Um, um, so also, I think what was very important in the guidelines, just wrapping things up, uh, you know, promoting diverse leadership, this intercultural training, using uh, the toolkit that you that you launched already as well. I think with time, it will aid kind of normalize again, embedding cultural uh, competency in the system, and collecting the data. Uh, doing the organization assessments, I think it will just help to to adapt and to invest energy and resources in things that that do help. Thank you so much. And I think both you and the minister mentioned, you know, acknowledging that the bias, whether unconscious or otherwise, you know, it does exist and there are barriers there. And it's it's about working and, and normalizing kind of a, a person centered approach. So thank you so much um, for, for being with us and for the work you've thank also you, done on these guidelines and toolkit. Um, so coming to you next, uh, Blessing, um, you're, you're really welcome um, here today. And I mentioned in the intro that you're a sea change ambassador. So you know, I, I'm sure we'd, we'd love to, to hear a little bit more about that. 
Um, your cam, oh, yeah, no, I can see you now, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me on. And apologies if I come across as very <laughs> awkward or a bit tired. It's so ironic how my chronic illnesses and my mental illnesses decides to play today at an event about ethnic minorities and mental health. Um, but thank you so much for, for having me on today. No, you, you're very welcome. And yeah, thank you, especially um, for coming. Um, but yeah, so you're, you're an advocate and, and an ambassador for Sea Change. Um, do you want to speak a little bit about that and the work that, that you do in this area? Yeah, that's no worries. So I suppose the, the main work I would be doing with Sea Change is going along with their um, values and morals with raising awareness around mental health um, with the conversation around Ireland with their values of equality and empowerment and openness and etc um, and being the ambassador I would be using my lived experiences of having mental illnesses and you know using my story to encourage other people to open up um, in their own journey and in their own struggles um, and along with that, we would engage with the public through um, the Green Ribbon campaign, which we had um, last month. And I think the team was on um, exclusion and we would deliver um, talks and PowerPoint presentations and etc. to people in the workplaces, school, education, anywhere that we can and also engage with the public with, you know, giving out green ribbons and just getting people um, on board. And then in the meantime, I would be um, with other ambassadors contributing to the content with writing or podcasting. And yeah, the, the overall message is just to try to reach as many people as we can through the amazing organization. Yeah, no, it's it's really it's really humbling to hear your work and how much that you're you're putting into to making a change for others. Um, in terms of maybe your own experiences of using the, the mental health um services here in Ireland, you know, were there any challenges that that you face while accessing the services that you know we we, we may need to to kind of change or improve upon? I, I suppose there, with with things, there there is always room for improvement. Um, but I guess stemming from my experiences of growing up in Ireland, um, you know, in, in the introduction, I would be uh, the first child in in my family of four kids, and you know that that comes with its own struggles of being black and Irish. Um, in a predominantly white society. And, you know, there, there's a term called parentification. So that basically means where the child kind of adapts the roles of the parent and um, kind of like reverse roles. And I suppose it's, it's not always a bad thing because we've all been parentified in different ways, whether it's like looking after your siblings and that type of stuff. But the reason why I kind of brought it up is because the, the cultural stigma that comes with it and um, there's a there's a certain expectation when it comes to being um a first generation black irish in ireland and you know my parents had to learn everything about irish society and politics through their kids so basically growing up and um, you know I, I i struggled with my mental health through various situations that happened in my life there's just so much to go on and when it comes to trying to access and look for help, obviously my parents couldn't help me in that because they're learning about Irish society through me. So I basically had to take that ownership and leadership in, in that myself since a very young age. Um, and obviously when you're under 18, there's not really much that you can do. It goes back to the parents. So there's just this vicious cycle of, I guess, nothingness happening. Um, so I've, I've been struggling with mental illnesses my whole life and really only came to terms about it between the ages of 12 to 14. And obviously I fell through the gaps of trying to 
access services um, because you need, you know, par parent um, guidance in that. And it was, it, it was difficult at the time because everyone deserves to be seen and treated with dignity and getting help for, for their mental health. But seeing friends who are struggling with the same issues as me, but seeing that they had support and I didn't, it was very, um, it, it was very painful to witness. And then, so fast forward to being over 18, I only started to really get proper help only in the space of a year and a half. And um, obviously the domino effects of like many issues in society, such as, you know, um, domestic violence and chronic illnesses and that type of stuff would have an effect on you later on in life. Um, and, you know, with, with that experience in between, um, you know, I, I would experience medical racism. And, you know, when I, when I talk about medical racism, people, you know, roll their eyes and they're like, you know, you talk about racism all the time and it's everywhere. And my answer to them is, you know, I'm not black part-time, I'm born black and I'm gonna die black and I'm gonna experience things in life through the lens of being black. Um, so, you know, when I was trying to get help after I turned 18, I had to change GPs last year because, you know, I was just being told that black women from my culture are strong and that my parents came to Europe to give me a better life. Why should I be struggling when they've gone through war and poverty and et cetera? Um, and, and just the, the issues of, you know, prejudice and biases just wasn't challenged there. And it, it blocked many um, passages in, in trying to get help. So like, luckily at the moment I am with a much better GP. Um, but, you know, there, there needs to be education in, you know, intersectionality and, you know, decolonizing your education and making sure that the help that you know, you you give to people is um, given on like an individual experience and just listening to other people. Um, and yeah, th th it's it's still an issue at the moment and um, something that I'm still going through at the moment. But, um, you know, one thing that just popped into my head right now is an example that would come to my head is, you know, the situation of, you know, George Nakensho that unfortunately died last year. Um, you know, he had mental illnesses and, you know, obviously he was waiting for a long time for help with the HSC and it never came through. And, you know, there was just obvious kind of supports that he felt through the cracks in and, you know, just seeing the response from people last year. And, um, you know, it, it, it really hurts to see that because that easily could have been me. But, you know, luckily I got the help last year. So all these little things, and um, needs to be considered to not let anyone else go through the same thing. No, and, and thank you so much for, for, for sharing and for, I, I think often we, we don't hear enough of, you know, we, we progress so much in, in Irish society, but that racism is still very prevalent. You know, we have the studies to show and that, you know, we, we need to recognize it and to, to speak up. Um, and running over time, but is there yes, any sorry about three that. sentences? No, it's my fault. Um, is there anything you know you think would 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 make you know for for the next generation coming behind? You know what would make mental health services more culturally sensitive, or is there anything that stood out in the guidelines to you that you want to to let the professionals tuning in today to pay particular attention to? Um. You know, seeing the report, it, it made me emotional because I was like, it's such a long time coming. Like, you know, I just want to like spread it and share it to everyone as much as possible. And um, the, the biggest thing I, I want people to know that is, you know, unfortunately living in a capitalist society that, you know, being involved in mental health sectors, it is a privilege to you know, not care about politics if that's not on your mind, because a lot of the issues that went through, that I went through growing up and even still to now, um, you know, obviously medication 
helps with your mental health and obviously going outside for fresh air helps with your mental health but you know also issues of you know direct provision and you know issues with um fees in the education system and um, growing up i wanted to become a, a psychologist or a therapist or etc but obviously the barriers to education to even trying to progress to there was an issue in, in itself so you know at the moment i know people are saying that we need more diversity and inclusion in in the mental health sector but in order for that to happen we need to also look at other issues that are contributing to the the hindering of progress and um, and also to know that you know intersectionality and challenging your prejudice and biases it is important to move forward in 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 this area and that's to work with people with lived experiences from a place of collaboration and not from a place of authority and um, because you know even speaking out online the, most of the feedback that i sometimes get it which is a small minority is that you know i i can't really be saying much i don't have a degree in this area but you know the one thing that sea change highlights is that you know your lived experiences is just as important as you know people who have a professional degree and it even goes beyond that because it makes people feel that they're not alone in whatever that they're going through and that's why i speak out because i want people to know that you know mental illnesses doesn't have a look um, and it doesn't discriminate but the help does sometimes and um, so that's the message to they're strong Let words, Lexi. And I think, <laughs> you know, from, from all of us, you know, there's a couple of hundred people listening in today and you are an expert by your experience. And, and I think your input has been so vitally important today. So so thank you. And yeah, we, we, we'll all continue to work together, you know, to, to make these guidelines um, come to life. So thank you both, Blessing and Amelia. And um, I, I think I, I, I let the conversation, I think it's been so interesting, flow over a little bit. Um, so un unfortunately, we don't have any time for um, any, any questions and answers. Um, but Gary, who I'll be introducing, um, will be giving out um, some details if there is any questions on anything that, that was raised today. Um, but I just want to say thank you before I hand over to Gary, um, in particular, just to emphasize with such engagement with individuals from ethnic minority communities who took so much time in responding to our questionnaires um, and, and coming to focus groups. So, you know, th this is this is your 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 document and your input. Um, so a little bit later th than we hoped, um, I want to hand over back to, to the Mental Health um, Commission. And I would like to, to introduce um, Gary, who is the, the director of, 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 um, of regulation sorry Gary I've, I've just uh, closed your your title there um but yeah thank you so much and I'll let you let you close thanks thanks very much Fiona and just to very briefly for um uh, to tell you about some next steps and uh where we go from here with ethnic minority guidelines as we work to make them real to make people aware of them to ensure people uh, know about them and that they use them and they use them in their services to to drive improvements uh, which is what we, we want to see um i want to thank all of my colleagues from the mental health commission and indeed uh, colleagues from mental health reform who've worked to revise and update and, and make these guidelines uh, uh, current um i want to thank everybody who participated in the focus groups and the interviews to to, to help us uh, inform them I want to particularly thank uh, Minister Butler for attending today and for helping us to, to raise awareness about these guidelines. And I also want to particularly thank Amelia and uh, Blessing uh, for their contribution today and for helping us really to, to put ourselves in the shoes of somebody from a different uh, background and uh, to help us to understand uh, what it's like to, to walk in those shoes and to access mental health services in Ireland and, and, and what that means for people and what it feels like. Um, so I think that's really important and thank you for that. Um, 
uh, in relation to our um, um, our dissemination plan and our awareness campaign, we will be contacting all of the approved mental health centres that we engage with, that we regulate, and all of the mental health services that we monitor and engage with to uh, inform them about these guidelines and uh, to raise awareness about them. We'll also be uh, incorporating them into our, our monitoring plans uh, as we go forward, as we monitor uh, 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 mental health services. Um, I think it's really important to, 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 to recognize that these guidelines are happening at a time when the mental health, the heads of, of bill to, to revise the Mental Health Act have just been published in July. And uh, you know, we're at a time where there's 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 an increasing focus on human rights, on a person-centered care, on recovery-focused care, on communication. And uh, we, we can't do these things on, 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 and, and focus on these things unless we, we observe and take note of what's contained in these guidelines today. So I'm conscious that people will have questions and may have questions that they want to ask us about the guidelines and how, how they will be implemented. So you can direct those uh, questions to either of the email addresses that are displayed on our screen there today. Um, we hope that you'll find the guidelines practical and useful. Please do contact us with any um, queries that you do have. I'd also like to highlight that the Mental Health Commission uh, has produced uh, a suite of information booklets uh, for people who are, who are accessing inpatient mental health services. And we've, we've translated those into uh, nine different languages and people can access those on our uh, website as well. So um, I'd, at this stage, we've gone over time. So I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us and we look forward to meeting you all in.